Hi, I'm Tegan O'Donovan. I'm a managing consultant at ISL Talent. Tegan O'Donovan is a managing consultant at ISL Talent who focuses on recruiting people in product and design. Her clients are startups and scale-ups in the tech space of all different industries. She loves helping her clients find the best people to drive business forward and watching her candidates flourish while they progress their careers. At ISL, they pride ourselves on being trusted partners for both job seekers and employers, and her main focus is building lasting relationships within the market. Whether you're new to product management or climbing the career ladder, there's one person you can't do without whether you want it or not, the recruiter. In this episode, Tegan shares her view of the market. Spoiler alert, it's competitive. How she works with candidates and companies and how you can get the next role that really works for you. Listen for lots of tips for interviewing and taking full advantage of the candidate recruiter relationship. Welcome to Product Perspectives, the podcast for product people that gives a voice to their stakeholders, hosted by Magali Pelissier. Each weekly episode shows you the other side of the product with interviews of the people who contribute to making products a success. They are engineers, writers, marketers, support analysts, UX designers, or even salespeople. Not only will they get the credit they deserve, but they will share their perspectives on what makes a good product and product manager. Stakeholder management is a key skill for product managers. So just as you're obsessed with listening to your customers, let's hear from your stakeholders. Hi, Tegan. Finally, you're on a podcast. That's great because we've been collaborating together for some time now. And finally, we have time to discuss about a topic which is quite important to me at the moment, which is recruitment and finding a job. And I'm sure it will be so important for the audience with so many layoffs that happened in the tech industry. So welcome to Product Perspectives. Yes, thank you. Thanks for having me. Obviously, we've been speaking for a little while now, so I'm really excited to finally be able to record with you. First, you had a very interesting journey into recruitment. So can you talk me through your background and how you came about being a recruiter? I lived in Canada for most of my life, and then I moved to the UK. I always knew that I wanted to be in some sort of sales, and that was where my strengths lied with speaking with people. And But recruitment wasn't a huge thing in Canada, so I was thinking maybe I wanted to be in house sales or some sort of tech sales. And then from living in the UK, I just heard people talking about recruitment and thought, That would be something I'd be interested in, would be good at, and then interviewed at a few places and landed at ISL. And I've been here for four and a half years. So let's talk about the job market and especially around product. And I know you're so specialized in design, but what are the current trends in the job market for product management? So I think products becoming a lot bigger topic and a very important function in businesses that are growing and a lot more companies are becoming very product centric. So whereas I think it used to maybe be a function that come in a little bit later, people are looking to hire product people in their first 10 hires, their first five hires. So, and I would say kind of the big trends at the moment that everybody's speaking about in all kind of areas of business is AI, machine learning, climate tech, health tech, anything really that is tech for good and kind of changing the way that we operate and doing good in the world is is such a big topic at the moment. And that's exciting because as product managers, I think we care about having an impact and realizing a vision. So when you talk about climate tech and health tech, these are big problems to solve and they have a huge impact on people's lives. Talking about the different industries, there's been obviously different moves at the moment due to the the current economic situation. Which industries are still growing? What's happening in the market? Yeah, I think it's hard because it's like such opposite ends of the spectrum at the moment. There's obviously, sadly, companies that are having to make redundancies, people that are maybe on hiring pauses. But then at the same time, there's lots of companies that are getting funding, they're growing, they're maybe in the kind of highest growth phase that they've seen so far. And I would say a lot of the companies that we see in these positions are the ones that I mentioned above, people that are in climate tech or sustainable farming or health tech. They're they're creating a product that's changing the way that we view health or the way that we view healthcare. So I would say a lot of those companies, there's a demand for them. And so those are are the ones that we're seeing 
a lot of investment and, and growth in. Talking about what's trendy and what is really sought after in terms of PM skills and experience, I've seen lots of jobs specializing in AI, right? What are the, the skills and type of experience that people are looking for in PMs? A lot of companies are saying they ideally want somebody that has been in a startup environment before. I mean, that could just be a trend with our clients because we work with so many startups and scale-ups, but I think understanding that very early stage environment that they would be in. I also think a lot of people, because these companies are so highly technical, are looking for someone that's been in technical environments that can have those conversations, potentially even someone that's been in a technical role for part of their career and then transition to product and can have those more in-depth conversations with the development team. And then I'm seeing lots of people looking for fast experience. I think there's lots of software as a service companies, obviously to some extent, like industry specific experience and clients will look for, but yeah, very technical, maybe other startup experience, and then having shown like proven results at what, where they worked before. So Sometimes we think, oh, companies are searching for the perfect candidates and candidates are searching for the perfect company. So what are the commonalities you see between your clients, the companies and the candidates? No matter what side you're on, you have probably been on the candidate side at some point, maybe not the client side, but um, you could have had some involvement in an interview or seen your team hire or spoken about it before. But I think everybody has experiences being a candidate. What both sides of the fence are looking for is some of that they can trust, whether they're growing their team or they're looking for a new job, someone that's going to work in their best interest, can give them insight into the market and be there alongside making this big decision. And I mean, making that um key hire is is very crucial and can also be an expensive mistake. Um, and same for a candidate, getting a job that doesn't work out, it's so time consuming, and then obviously your own livelihood to worry about. So I think having someone that, that you can trust to go to to help you make this decision, make sure you're fully informed, and you can bounce ideas off of is important for, for both clients and candidates. Let's dive deeper into the job searching process. And one of the things that I've always found interesting, but also a bit confusing, is that as a recruiter, you are paid by the hiring company, not by the candidate. So yeah. does this have an impact on the decisions you make and how you support candidates? I think it has an impact, but I think it has a, a positive impact because recruitment's all about relationships. There's a million and one recruiters out there. So your clients are going to work with you specifically on how you work with them, how well they can um, trust you to build their team and people stay there so yeah obviously it's all about somebody getting the job but if somebody stays in that job and does wonders for the team and the project everyone's going to be happy the client's going to be happy the candidate's going to be happy they're likely to come back to you and then also the candidate's likely to come back to you three five years down the line when they're looking again so I definitely see some recruiters doing this very well so you've described some industries which are growing right now but not all PMs come from these industries right not everybody is already working in health tech not everybody already has an AI background. So if a candidate has been in another industry for a long time and they're trying to pivot, how do you recommend they go about it? Yeah, I think it's a tough one because obviously clients sometimes go into a job search with a list of requirements that they're looking for. But I've seen that evolve over time as the job search goes on. Sometimes they end up hiring somebody that has come from a completely different background than what they expected, but it's because they were the most passionate about the role. They demonstrated that they can learn. They demonstrated that they have transferable skills. So I think it definitely is doable. I would say do your research on the industry, do your research on what those types of clients would be looking for. Maybe speak to some people who are in similar roles or in similar companies, build your network. Getting a referral from somebody speaks wonders rather than just sending your CV. So if you could go to a couple of events that are focused on climate tech, you can build your network and have more contacts that could get you in there. And then also, I think if a company's in pretty early stages of hiring somebody in product, they might just need the key aspects of a product manager. They may need somebody that's advisory, somebody who can come in and say, this is what I think you need. And then they might not be looking for specific industry experience. They might be looking for someone who can really own the process. And if you can demonstrate that you've done that previously, then the industry experience might, might not matter and all your other 
skills will be very transferable. And then you can learn the industry as you go. But there will be industries that maybe your tech experience directly relates to the product, but your industry experience does it. You can get in that way, learn more about the industry. Then your next role in three years, you know the industry and you have the tech experience. So it kind of evolves if you can get kind of one foot in the door and then and then continue the process from there. This is a message for people who are listening to this podcast and recruiting as well. So like hiring managers in product. Sometimes I think the job descriptions, they really require you to have an experience in that particular industry. And I think that Eva puts a lot of candidates off and we know that in that case, minorities and, and women, for example, may not apply if they don't tick all the boxes. And so you're, you're right that maybe it's about being open, that this person has the right experience. They know the product management process and they can learn because I think one of the main qualities of a product manager is being curious and being able to learn about something and become a subject matter expert on that topic very quickly. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's another role as well of a recruiter is you can put a job description and ad out there all you want and it can have 10 like tick boxes, but it's my job to speak to the hiring manager and really dig deep into what's the most important, what's the objective of this role, and then speak to people at length about what they've done, when they've demonstrated that, what they're looking for, and be more of, of, of a voice of the company and the position that can go into so much more detail than just a job description and find those little tidbits that maybe a CV wouldn't show a hiring manager and then and then give them a ring and say, no, listen, this is what they've done. It's amazing. They can do it for you. So I think that's another benefit of working with a recruiter is they can highlight that experience so much more than just like a CV can. And do you think talking about that, that you can also have an influence on the diversity of the candidate pool? Because as I've just given an example of minorities may not apply if they don't tick all the boxes. Well, if you've got those types of profiles, maybe you're more likely to put them in front of companies. What's your role in the diversity initiative? We've spoken to clients a lot about this. I think there's a variety of different things. There's, you can do blind CV screening. So kind of strip the CV of any, of anything just kind of leaves their, their experience. But also, yeah, as you said, some people might not apply to an ad because of how it's written or the wording in it. So I think it's just about going out there, approaching everybody based off their experience, and then really being able to put forward to the client a variety of options from all different backgrounds. One of the things you have haven't mentioned directly in this episode yet, but last time we talked, you said it is a candidate driven market and it is still despite all the layoffs that happened. Do you think the candidates are really taking advantage of this and they are interviewing back the companies too? Yeah, I mean, I think everyone should be doing this. I say to every candidate when they go into an interview, like this interview is just as much for them to interview you as for you to interview them. You need to make sure this is a good fit. You need to make sure that they can provide the progression that you want, the well-being initiatives that you want. Yeah, I think people should ask questions. I think that people should add an extra stage. If the client only wants to do two stages and by the end of that, you haven't spoken to enough people or you don't have enough information, then ask if you can go on site, ask if you can speak to more people. I think candidates really have the opportunity now to make sure they have all the information that they need and shouldn't be pressured to take an offer just because it's it's there in front of them. I think that's a really good piece of advice to ask for meeting more people if it's necessary, even if it's another round of interview. I've done it in the past and Usually when you ask for this, first of all, the, the answer is quite positive. And also it's not really an interview. It's more an informal conversation. And you are in that position where you are actually interviewing the company and you can get all the information you need. So that's quite beneficial. Everybody wants to save time to an extent, but I think that's been pushed so far in another way where it's like, let's do two one hour interviews and close it off in a week. Like, okay, yeah, if you can get all the information you need in that time and you have no reservations, then fine. But there's, this is your job for potentially the next like few years or, or longer. So yeah, I don't think there's anything wrong with taking a little bit longer and making sure that you don't have one reservation in your mind by the time you, you get to the end of the process. Perfect. Let's talk about end of the process then. As a candidate, when we receive an offer, it can be really hard to wait for another offer. 
you know, because the timing is not quite right. We're waiting for something else. We're still in round two with another company, which we prefer. We don't really know how to negotiate either. So what do most candidates do? And is it the right thing to do? Is it not? How can they do it better? The number one thing is to talk about it at every stage. So on our first call, talk about what opportunities you have. On the second call, talk about how this opportunity compares to your other opportunities. I think it should be spoken about multiple times to the point where it might be like, why are you asking me this again? But it's good to know things change so quickly. You might have a company that's like your third choice. You do another round with them. Suddenly they change your mind. You love them. Um, and if we don't speak about that or speak about the reasons why you love them, it's hard to know, know where you stand. And I think candidates get afraid like, if I tell the recruiter that maybe I like another job a little bit better, they're not going to want to talk to me anymore. They're not going to want to interview. They're not going to prioritize it. But for me, it's better to know, okay, you like this other company better because there's this progression route. Sorry, maybe I didn't explain to you the progression routes in this company. Let me put you in front of the manager and they can tell you what their progression plans look like, how their one-to-ones operate. And then you could have the exact same opportunities with this client, you just don't know. So I think it's about getting to the end of the process and knowing, okay, if this company offers me, I want to take it. Or if this company offers me, I have another interview next week and I prefer that one for X, Y, and Z. And if in that interview, they prove to me then I want to take that one. I think where candidates make a mistake is they love the role, but they're just waiting to see what other offers that they can get. If you don't have any other reservations, then I don't see why you wouldn't take the role. But if there's things that are concerning you, then I think talk about them, get more stages booked in, as we just mentioned, and get those options cleared up. But I think it should get to the point where you've spoken about it so much that you should know by the time an offer is coming, what it needs to look like, what the conditions need to be, and are you going to accept it? And if everything matches what you wanted, then what are the reasons that you wouldn't take the job once that offer comes through? So I just want to confirm for the audience, because you talk about the recruiter. So in that case, that's you as an external recruiter. But do you recommend the same approach, like being honest and transparent with the companies themselves? If, for example, I'm involved in a process, but I didn't go through a recruiter, I applied directly. Can we really tell them, actually, I prefer this other job? I mean, <laughs> you have to word it differently. Maybe, you know, phrase it in, oh, this other job offers me this, and I'm not quite clear yours does as well. Yeah, I think it's a fine line. I mean, you probably don't want to tell a client that maybe like give a hint that you're like not that interested or not that bought in. I think it's exactly about what you just said. I've interviewed here. They mentioned this. Is that something that you offer so that you know how they can compare and you can kind of weigh up the pros and cons? I'd definitely be like honest with a client about I have other interviews. These are my timelines because they should be very clear. Like if you have four other final stages and they're only at the second stage, maybe they need to combine things or move a little faster. So I would communicate your timelines. I would communicate your thought process, but yeah, maybe ask a few more exploratory questions about the things that you're concerned about that another company might offer to get your answers <laughs> um, rather than just being like, I like them better. So we'll just see. Cause yeah, that probably wouldn't, wouldn't fly very well. <laughs> Yes, definitely. Uh, I think that's a very good way. I like the idea of putting it as a question and exploratory to really understand if they can offer the same because very often it's actually a question of misunderstanding or we just didn't talk about it, so we don't know. Yeah, and I think for the right candidate, you might think, okay, they want four days a week in the office every week. And then you say, I like another job better because they give me two days. The client might love you and say, oh, well, if that's the case and that's the only thing we need to change, yeah, we can do that. So just because they've outlined what they're looking for in the beginning, for the right person, it normally can be flexible. You just need to communicate that that's the one thing that you need to be on board. Perfect. And once I've gotten an offer and then I'm trying to see if I'm getting other ones, how long do I have to really respond? Like, what do you think is appropriate in terms of time and how many days to stop negotiate and to give a definite answer? Laying out those timelines and being really clear from the beginning is good because if they know you have other opportunities that you still want to see, then they know what that'll look like. But I would say you don't want to give the impression that 
you're not interested, you're just waiting for something better. So at most a couple weeks, or a couple weeks, sorry, a couple days, <laughs> a couple days, maybe a week, definitely you'd see people maybe on a Friday saying, I'll come back to you on Monday, I need to think or by the end of the day, but I wouldn't leave it more than a few days longest a week, because you start to give the illusion that maybe you're not interested, you're just waiting for something else. And you don't want to create that doubt. If there is doubt on your end, then yeah, you kind of need to get those those questions answered and give yourself a deadline. Also, I feel like you can create like a whirlwind in your mind of going back and forth and nitpicking and finding little bits if you give yourself too much time. So I think saying, okay, by the end of the day on Wednesday, I'm going to have spoken to my partner, I'm going to have weighed up the pros and cons, I'm going to decide what my life would look like at each place and make a decision forces you to think about it. If you just say, I'll think about it sometime, people just avoid it. People will just avoid making that decision. So I think setting a deadline for yourself as well is is important. That's a great tip. Thank you. I want to go back to what you said initially that AI is obviously growing very quickly, but I'm assuming AI must have an impact on the way you work as a recruiter as well. So how is AI right now or in the future? changing the recruitment process yeah so i think we're seeing as i mentioned like a lot of things based off diversity inclusion so you can use different tools to change the language in your ads or change the way that you screen cvs or yeah blind screen cvs so things like that is great i think there's obviously different processes now that people can use for like candidate matching or different job boards that can match you better with certain companies that you're looking for. I think really at the moment, everyone's just trying to (laughs) figure out how to stay up to date, how to not get left behind, what tools are best to use, but also you don't want to lose the human element of recruitment. I mean, we're dealing with people on either sides, client and candidate, and then myself who is a person. So I think the human element, the understanding, the conversation, that's always going to be important. But I think using AI to improve your sales techniques or even just speed things up. I mean, there's definitely been times now where a client gives me a role and you can go and search on chat GTP, there are 10 competitors in two seconds and it's right there. Whereas before you probably would have had to do a lot more research and take more time. Whereas you then know exactly who's their competitor. You can go have a look at what candidates will be perfect. And it, it just saves an element of time. For me, I've just been using it more as like a research tool to, to cut out some of those lengthy processes that it takes from getting a job and then starting to whittle down who the best, best candidates will be. But yeah, I think we'll see this change a lot and a lot of people trying different things in, in the next few years for sure. I think there are sometimes misconceptions about recruiters, especially from a candidate standpoint. And I wanted to ask you, what do you think these misconceptions are and which is the one you particularly disagree with? And you could explain me why. I think it's a hard one because a lot of people work in different ways. I don't think the bad stigma comes from probably nowhere. I'm sure people have had bad experiences and it's always a, a learning tool, I think, Number one for me is is getting feedback from people that you placed, but also that you didn't, good and bad, so that you can always improve. Most of my friends I know in recruitment and that work at ISL, there's such a stigma of just, we will do anything for money. Like put the wrong person in the wrong job, convince anybody of anything. Like it's all just about, I will swindle my way into making money, which is so beyond untrue. I think this has become such customer service type of job and customer satisfaction is a big thing. And also just using your own morals and doing the right thing. That's one of our values at ISL. It's on the wall. It literally says do the right thing. Like there's so many times where you have in your in your gut like no this probably isn't the right position for this person and yeah it doesn't benefit you in the short term saying to them like I don't think that this is a good idea but in the long run it's going to work out so much better and that just goes back to building relationships so I'm sure that differs but I think that's one of the number one things that that I just want to communicate is yeah I'm here to help everyone and I want it to work out just as much as they do perfect right let's hear the question from a job seeker Hi, Tegan. My question would be, there are a lot of international candidates looking for opportunities in the UK, specifically the students. Visa rules keep changing and also give students the right to work in the UK. 
in my experience not all recruiters are aware of their right to work that comes with the student visa or the post study work visa so i would like to know how do the recruiters keep up with the changing rules and also make sure the candidates are given the correct opportunities thank you Hi, Namrata. Yeah, thanks so much for your question. I think it's a really important topic, something I can relate to considering I'm on a visa and I moved here from another country. So yeah, I think obviously in terms of the changing requirements, obviously referring to the government website is helpful. I think understanding those visa situations and how long they want to stay here is important and important communicating that to our clients. I definitely have clients that sponsor. Another way to look for more opportunities after you study or looking for sponsorship is the government lists every company that has a sponsorship license. You can go on there, see how long their license is valid for, and then you can specifically target those companies in your job search. It's a little bit easier on a post-study visa because you get the two years where you don't need sponsorship. So yeah, I think just using that to gain experience and then once you have that experience, it's likely that another company will sponsor you now that you've gained a bit more work experience and can demonstrate your skills a bit better. I hope this helps. Good. And do you have a question for me as well? It's what is most important to you in your candidate recruiter relationship when it comes to seeking a new position? Great. Well, I think I was hinting at it through the questions I asked because the first one is trust and I want to fully trust that you act in my best interest not just in the company's best interest and this comes from your right having sometimes some not so great experiences with maybe a recruiter yeah. being a bit pushy or trying to make me fit into a role that wasn't quite for me yeah and then I really like the proactivity I'm going to give you an example there are some recruiters that I keep on chasing <laughs> and sometimes they come to me for a role and I'm like, yeah, that sounds great. Here's my CV. And then I never hear back from them and I have to chase yeah. again. So I really like when people are proactive, like for example, this morning, I received a call, somebody had a new role, they thought about me. And I think that's the whole point of having someone who already has your CV, you already had an initial chat with them. They already know your profile and what you are interested in. So yeah. when they see something, they think about you. Obviously, they, don't, they can't remember dozens and dozens of candidates. So I'm sure you've got a system for that. But being proactive for me, it's so much more important because otherwise, if I have to do everything and find the opportunities for myself, I don't need a recruiter. Exactly. No, I, I definitely understand that. And I think it does take a bit of time and organization, but I think either way, whether someone got the job or didn't or the client went quiet or the role was paused, just giving them a quick call or a message and letting them know and keeping them in the loop is probably the number one thing that I find people appreciate. And the feedback when you do that is always, yeah, they kept in regular contact. They kept me up to date. And, and that seems to be something that, yeah, people obviously really appreciate. So I definitely understand where, where you're coming from on that one. And for me, this is a must have, like this is a basic, but if I think about the very great recruiters I've had, and obviously, I've got fewer examples, not because there are not that many out there, but because I'm talking about the end of a process. And usually, there's not that many end of processes compared yeah. to the number of applications. It's when they are able to really give me feedback at every stage and give me some advice towards the end as well yes i think we can push a bit on the salary yes i think you can negotiate this don't wait too much we've got these other candidates so i think that advice like that insider information making the link between me and the company it helps a lot in the final negotiation as well it's good for me to hear as well because obviously yeah we try to do that as best we can because i think this is where you add value as well compared to me applying directly yeah so let's move on to the final part of the interview, which is fire questions. So I will make several propositions to you and you pick one of them. And if you want, you can elaborate. In-house or consultant? Consultant. Startup or scale-up? I think startup just because it's really exciting and you can talk to them about like where they're where they're going, what their plans are. But scale up as well, they're growing so much. But I think I think startup getting getting there from the start of the journey is ex is exciting. London or the rest of England? <laughs> I guess like for me, like countryside, maybe a little bit out of the big city, but, but go into London to visit. Product management or design? 
I I think product management potentially love both. I think design is a little bit more subjective. So nailing down exactly what somebody needs takes a, a bit more time. But yeah, so maybe product management. Candidate or interviewer? I'd rather be the interviewer just because it's stressful. It's stressful doing an interview. Um, but but yeah. <laughs> Great. So can you, to wrap this up, give a final piece of advice for the product managers out there who are looking for a job at the moment? Speak to a lot of people, build your network, have those conversations that maybe aren't going to give you a win straight away, but you never know who knows somebody who knows somebody who's looking for a role. So I think build your network. You never know where an opportunity will come from. Perfect. And if people are looking for a job and they would like to get in touch with you how can they reach out to you yeah so people can add me on linkedin my name is tegan o'donovan i work for isl talent or send me an email at tegan at isltalent.com perfect well thank you so much tegan for all these great tips in searching for a job which i'm i'm sure will be super useful to lots of people listening thank you so much this has been great and it's been good to hear from your side of things as well and yeah thanks for having me on Thank you everyone for taking the time to listen to this podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and colleagues and rate it on your favorite podcast platform. If you have suggestions for topics and guests or any feedback, you can write to Magali Pellissier at hotmail.fr.